test. Oh, excellent. All right, uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, uh, accepting my talk. And uh, thanks everyone else who has given uh, very nice talks during this conference. My name is Joachim Löbgren. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Alta University in the SESH group led by uh, Professor Patrick Rinke. And I will continue the trend today to talk about uh, machine learning in connection with experimental work. Uh, more precisely, I will talk about Bayesian optimization for uh, experimental materials design. So let's start by imagine a very general scenario where you want to maximize uh, the output from an experiment as a function of the input. Um, now, what do I mean by inputs and outputs? Well, the inputs can be anything, right? It can be processing conditions. It can be some settings of your apparatus. It can be physical chemical properties of your reactants um, and so on. Outputs is anything you measure, uh, yield of some chemical you've synthesized, uh, properties of the products. Uh, and what we do then is we want to develop some kind of model for the outputs. Uh, and this laser pointer is not very good but so you want to develop some kind of model of the outputs as a function of the inputs and uh, so the type of experiments that we have in mind in our work are usually derived from chemistry or biochemistry and they typically take several days of work for processing and characterization so we're not really in a high throughput scenario uh, so in other words um, every sample is precious, and if you go to our experimental collaborators and you say you want 200 samples, they, they will say no. Uh, so then, of course, our goal is to perform as few experiments as possible. And then we, of course, immediately think of Bayesian optimization. So the kind of... Uh, the kind of loop that we have going is that we have some experiment uh, and where we measure some outputs given some input conditions, right? And then we feed those uh, to our Bayesian optimization uh, algorithm, which is powered by uh, this BOSS software that those of you who attended uh, the school uh, on Tuesday will recognize. Um, then BOSS performs Bayesian optimization, suggests new input conditions for you, and these are fed back to the experiment. Uh, and then in the middle here, we have something called AMAD, which is Alto's uh, Materials Digitalization Platform, uh, which is basically uh, an online notebook format that uh, is intended to help replace uh, traditional lab notebooks. Uh, and also, it it's also can be used for simulations. Um, so we use this as a way of sharing and storing uh, data. Um, right, so uh, uh, to give you all a more sort of uh, a better picture uh, of how this process looks like, let's study an example, uh, namely uh, a lignin biorefinery. Uh, now, as many of you here have a computational background, which I also have, you might wonder what is a lignin biorefinery. <laughs> um, so in general, biorefineries, they start from biomass, right? And then they try to make useful uh, products. Uh, lignin is an aromatic polymer. It's found in the cell walls of uh, plants, especially woody plants, um, where you have a lot of them. As you can see by this picture here to the left, this is just a sort of a template for how lignin can look. It's a super complicated polymer. So this is very hard to model, for instance. Um, so then we take uh, biomass, which contains lignin, uh, wood typically, and we feed it through some biorefinery process to be defined. Uh, and then in the end, hopefully we get some, oh, there's a, uh, an image missing here. Okay. Imagine a pretty image of a bio-based product here. 
Um, so in the end, we hopefully get some chemicals or materials or something else uh, that is hopefully more sustainable. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is sort of in general what what what, what a lignin biorefinery does. And now we will study uh, how we can use biochain optimization how to optimize um, a specific lignin biorefinery. So this uh, biorefinery is called Aquasolve Omni. This was designed by some of our collaborators at Bioproducts um, in the Bioproducts department at Alto. Um, and it's not, if you don't understand how some of this works, it's, it's, uh, this is more of an example to show, sort of uh, demonstrate the general process. Uh, but basically what we do is we put some wood uh, sawdust or chips uh, inside uh, an HTT reactor, so hydrothermal treatment, basically just heating up by like boiling the wood. Um, out of this, we get some solids, which we then pour acetone on, and we get a small amount of acetone extracted lignin. lignin. Uh, this we can then characterize via two-dimensional NMR and determine uh, the content of like the chemical structure of this lignin, uh, in particular, we can determine uh, the uh, content of various chemical subunits that are important for different applications. For instance, there is the beta O4 linkages, there is the amount of carbohydrates, there's the ratio between syringeal and guaiso units. Um, and these are all uh, important in different applications of, of your lignin, right? Um, the inputs to this experiment uh, are. Uh, the P factor, which is a heuristic measure of sort of the severity of the reaction that goes on inside the reactor. Um, and this uh, ranges between 500 and uh, 2,500. Doesn't have a very meaningful unit. Um, and then we have the temperature inside the reactor, which ranges between 180 Celsius to 210 Celsius. And then we also have a liquid to solid ratio. So the ratio of the wood we put in versus the water that's already inside the reactor. And this will we keep we will keep fixed at one until further notice. Right. So let's say we try to apply biochain optimization to this. Uh, first we have to let's click your fingers. Okay. Right. So first we have to decide what is it that we're going to optimize exactly. Well one thing we always want is to have a high yield of the lignin, right? That makes sense. Uh, and then we typically want a high fraction of at least one of these different subunits that we characterized via the NMR. So we might want a high beta O4 content. Uh, we might like a high, high carbohydrate content if we're making, let's say, carbon nanofibers. We might want a high SG ratio if we are intending to break down the lignin into uh, useful chemicals. Um, also, the particular setup that they have um, in the lab um, works best if they can process their experiments in batches. So we want to do batch acquisitions. So we have multiple objectives. We have a, the lignin yield and at least one property, right? And then we have batch acquisitions. So how do we solve this? Well, our original idea was to create independent Gaussian processes for the lignin yield and for the beta 4 content, and then do batch acquisitions where we make uh, four acquisitions in total. We do one uh, ELCB acquisition. So ELCB is a form of a modified version of the LCB acquisition function, which you've seen before. Uh, which puts more emphasis on exploration. Uh, it all, it ramps, basically ramps up exploration as the number of iterations gets higher. Um, and we do similar for the beta 4 content, which we're also trying to optimize in this case. And then we also add some pure exploration since the uh, uh, experimentalists we were working with, they were interested in optimizing these things, but they also were sort of asking themselves what you know is the general behavior of the yield as a function of the inputs. What does this look like? Well, if we start at 
the zeroth batch, so just having uh, initial points to initialize our Gaussian processes, these were just, uh, chosen as solvable points. Uh, you can see that the model is quite bad, uh, as expected, and the standard deviation is quite high. But then as we add points, uh, and we, so we have both uh, exploitation coming from this uh, ELCB uh, acquisition function, and we have exploration coming from the uh, pure exploration. By pure exploration, I mean just uh, acquisition function that's uh, proportional to the variance of, or the, sorry, the standard deviation of the Gaussian process. Uh, and then we update uh, our model. Uh, and suddenly the model start to look a bit better. And we kept going like this until we reached uh, batch four, which we decided was the final batch. Uh, and I will tell you very shortly why we decided that. And here you can see we have determined the maximum yield, uh, region of maximum yield for our lignin. And the standard deviation is uniformly low. Looks quite good. Uh, so this is a quite easy example, but we thought that this was a good starting place basically to see, uh, get a feel for how this works. Um, of course, how you have to decide when to stop. Uh, so in order to do that, we had a very small test of <laughs> a very small uh, test data set uh, consisting of seven points. <laughs> um, it's, it, uh, we will we'll, we will improve on this in the future. This was what we had. Uh, so, so to the left here, you can see the uh, the fit to the training data, which is of course uh, quite good. But there is also some error here, which is due to the noise we uh, mm -hmm, programmed into the model. Uh, and then you can see uh, the average error on the test data, which is roughly eight uh, percent which is on the order of the, the error which the experimentalist uh, estimated that they had. Right. Now, of course, come on, click it. Yeah, ah, okay. I don't know, it felt good pointing at the screen. Anyway, um, Right. So, of course, as other people have noted uh, earlier today, it's not cool. I mean, it's cool to make predictions, but it's cool. To, it would be even cooler if we could do something more. So, um, here is an example of uh, another property which was also measured during the data acquisition. Uh, although we didn't do acquisition specifically for this, uh, we were still able to get a decent model of the syringe and Weissel ratio. Now, let's say you want to make a material that requires um, lignin with a requires lignin with high SD ratio, but we also want lignin to be in a high yield, right? So we have some kind of multi-objective optimization problem. This we can solve by doing a Pareto point analysis. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, a Pareto point is basically a point that's an optimal trade-off between two different objectives. So to the left here, you see all the feasible combinations of lignin yield and SG ratio I can obtain by varying my processing conditions. Uh, and then if I can simply calculate these optimal trade-offs uh, by brute force, and I get this black sort of border here, which is known as the Pareto front. Now I can project these points back into my processing condition space and I can identify which black point on the Pareto front belongs to which point here. In other words, if you tell me what your desired combination is of, oops, wrong thing. Your desired combination is of uh, SU ratio and yield, I can tell you what processing conditions you should extract your lignin at. And uh, right, so we are a bit light on time. Uh, I just quickly want to show you that we have been now um, expanding on this work to 3D by actually varying the uh, 
liquid to solid ratio as well. Uh, and we have to solve that, we have uh, also revised this batch, batch strategy scheme we had. Basically, our previous scheme had pretty poor batch diversity since we, we had made all of these uh, acquisitions independently. But now we're actually doing them sequentially uh, using something that's called a Krieging believer strategy, which is uh, basically based on hallucinating um, observations uh, and refitting your model sequentially to build up a batch. And using this, we have now uh, gone to a 3D search. So here you can see the lignin yield uh, to the left at a specific value of uh, the liquid to solid ratio. And to the right, you can see the hydro carbohydrate content, sorry, that we're trying to also now trying to optimize. Uh, and uh, now the acquisition, these are the nearby acquisitions. Uh, so there are also uh, some that are in, in the LS space, let's say, uh, but they have in general a much nicer spread using this new uh, acquisition strategy. Thank you for listening. And if you're interested in this, uh, check out a recent publication. Uh, and also thanks to our project members and collaborators, both machine learning and in lignin chemistry. Uh, questions? Oh. Okay, thank you very much for nice talk. Uh, so one question would be, why haven't you started already with the three dimensions uh, instead of going before to just wanted to check it out? Or And second question would be, do you think there's a maximum of dimensions you could, could optimize at the same time? So you've been doing two, but what if you try with seven at the same time? Uh, so, so the first question was why three dimensions? Why two and then three and not three at the same uh, from the very beginning? Ah, well, um, we had basically never used our code before on experimental data, so we weren't sure how well it was going to work. So we so we figured two dimensions, then you can very easily visualize the results uh, with these kinds of maps. Uh, and it's also easier for your experimental collaborators to sort of see and understand the results. Um, so it, that basically was a, a decent starting point. Uh, so basically we came to our experimental collaborators and we asked what do you think are the most important variables, input variables to change, right? And they gave us these two. And then also later we decided to start to change this liquid to solid ratio. Uh, In the future, we're also looking to um, to do experiments with with a larger number of uh, of variables. But of course, in higher dimensions, you need a lot more data already in three dimensions, right? So in two dimensions, this is something like twenty points or something. Uh, you could probably push this a bit lower with a better batch acquisition scheme. But in three D, you're gonna have to go over forty or something, maybe forty, fifty, sixty points, let's say roughly. And uh, when one set of experiments takes a week to do, then <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's already quite difficult. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. And we'll continue with